because it is hosted by my co-host, please put your hands together for the moderator of this um, session, Mary Imaswe. It's me again, but in a different capacity. <laughs> um, so I'm really excited about this panel because I like the fact that as the idea of Bitcoin is spreading, um, people are coming up with different and more innovative ways of teaching Bitcoin to newbies or people who are interested in Bitcoin. And if you are a Bitcoin educator or maybe you are, you have a, you know, family members or friends that you want to orange pill, this panel will be quite interesting for you. And I want to call on stage my, the fellow panelists, um, Justin Redrick. Please come on stage, give him a round of applause. Yeah, let's keep clapping for him. He's doing amazing work. All right. Then I want to call on stage Ella. I don't want to burn. I don't want to butcher her last name. So Ella, please come on stage. <laughs> oh, Ella Half. <laughs> I hope I didn't butcher her last name. <laughs> <laughs> and next, we call on stage Joseph Tetek. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Why didn't, why didn't Ella have a round of applause? Please, you guys give Ella another round of applause. Come on. Now we're talking. Uh huh. I like the sound of that. Are you satisfied? <laughs> All right, so thank you so much for being on the panel. So let's just start with a round of introductions first, um, and let's make it quick so that we have more chance to discuss the questions. So yeah, let's start with um, yeah, Ella first. Will I these first, obviously. Yeah. Well, thanks everybody for being here. My name is Ella Huff. I am a third year university student, um, but outside of school, I am the project lead at Generation Bitcoin, um, and also now the co-founder of a group called the Bitcoin Students Network, and so glad to be here. Then let's have Justin. Go ahead, Justin. Hey everyone, I'm Justin Redrick on Twitter or X. I go by Bitcoin Vegan. I'm the executive director of the Bitcoin transformation community, and my claim to fame in this space is learning about Bitcoin coming out of prison in America. Uh, so we'll get into that later on, but I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much. And Joseph Tetek. Yeah, so my name is Joseph Tetek. I'm from Prague, Czech Republic, so long way from here. And uh, I'm the author of uh, a book, Bitcoin, Separation of Money and State. We've got some of the books here in the car, in the Bitcoin car outside. And I, and I work for Trezor, uh, leading the Trezor Academy, which is uh, 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 an initiative for like, Bitcoin education across Africa in form of face-to-face -face meetups, and we can touch on that later. Awesome. Yeah, let's give them a round of applause. So um, I'm really excited that they brought Ella here because she is really young. And, you know, catering to a younger audience can be, you know, different, right? I'm a millennial, you know, I'm still trying to learn all the Gen Z slangs. They left me at Riz and, you know, do it for the plot. <laughs> but um, so my question to you is, what are the barriers of entry for younger generations in learning about Bitcoin? Thank you. And Mary, I still am behind on some of the Gen Z slides, so you're okay. Um, but I think they can kind of be categorized into invisible, invisible barriers um, when you're speaking to those in Gen Z, younger, older. Um, at least in the West and how I've kind of been in this space, sometimes it's just sparking the initial curiosity. You just might not even know what the first question is. Um, and I think a large part of this is because in traditional education curriculum, financial literacy just in general is not taught. Um, and most people my age that I've interacted with see Bitcoin only as a monetary asset, not as you know freedom tech or energy savings tech, um, anything in the technology realm. So um, that's kind of an invisible barrier. Um, and then on the visible side, you know, a lot of people again think you have to buy the whole coin, whereas you know here in Africa, people do use Bitcoin as a medium of exchange. Um, so they realize you don't have to. Um, you know, a lot of people my age, we haven't really started saving. We don't have our nest eggs yet. 
Um, so much false news. You know, how do they know true from false? Um, who to follow? Where to go? Um, but there's so much really good educational content out there, and so that's one of the goals with the Bitcoin Students Network, what we're going to try and really help support. So a question to just add on that. Yeah. Um, I'm curious what the younger generation find interesting about Bitcoin the most. In your experience? Sure, and this is another hard question because, you know, what's great about Bitcoin is that there's something for everyone, I think, in it. Um, and so I guess a lot of people in my area are very into kind of the more technical aspects of Bitcoin. Um, also, another one of the co founders of Generation Bitcoin works a lot on the UI, UX. Um, so I wish I could give you a, a more definite answer as to what is one topic area, um, but. You know, I think for a lot of people, Bitcoin is your tool to, you know, find your purpose, live the life that you want to live, you know, protects your monetary wealth, so you can kind of grow your intellectual wealth. So that's my takeaway. You know, I don't need every person in my generation to understand all the components of Bitcoin. Just, you know, use it how it fits best for you. Awesome. So this, so this is a great segue into my next question, which yeah. is directed to Joseph. Um, what would you say is the most efficient educational um, tool for beginners in Bitcoin? Right, so from my experience, that's face-to-face uh, -face meetups. That is how I learned about Bitcoin first uh, in Parallel Polis. It's a special place in Prague where you learn about Bitcoin. And uh, I found out that uh, like having someone to ask questions and to answer and to showcase like how it works is uh, the best way to get started. Then you can go on from there to like uh, uh, Bitcoin books, podcasts, articles, videos. And uh, so that's why uh, like what we are doing with the Terzer Academy is uh, based on finding local Bitcoin educators across various communities and having them organize meetups face to face, not remote, but actual uh, group of people in the room and learning about Bitcoin, asking questions, trying out like lightning network transactions. Uh, and I would like to also touch on the previous question, like what works for the younger generation. So in uh, Czech Republic or Western Europe in general, it's kind of hard for people to, uh, for younger people to get interested in Bitcoin because they don't feel like the actual pressure. Uh, our currency is not that bad and you can like have Apple Pay and stuff. Uh, so usually uh, there are two things that work. First is uh, show them they can do like cool stuff with Bitcoin. So for example, we have like a sheep farm in Czech Republic that accepts lightning payments. And when you pay, the sheep get like some food dropped and it's live streamed. It's called Tangle Sheep, so I always use that and everybody always loves that. And the second thing is uh, to show them that we are actually very privileged in, uh, the, in Europe. And there are places like uh, Bitcoin Akasi or uh, where Joe Hall travels, like Cuba. And uh, well, actually uh, many places around the world, like majority of the population is not that privileged and Bitcoin actually works in those places. So like this human rights aspect sort of always works. So uh, that's how I approach it. That's really cool. Um, just allow me to ask one more question to you, Joseph. So you mentioned like in-person education is like quite effective. What are like three characteristics of a really good Bitcoin educator? Well, um, you have to really know uh, all that stuff like uh, on-chain, lightning, running a node, uh, a little bit about mining, about uh, like uh, the energy consumption, because this is what people are always asking about. So you know, you have to know your stuff. The second one would be uh, you have to answer like uh, the very basic questions all the time, and uh, you cannot show that you are like frustrated from that because everybody always asks the same questions. Uh, so you could you should uh, polish your answers, and it should be really like uh, obvious what what you mean. And the third one would be. Uh, be a positive person because a lot of people have this idea that Bitcoiners are sort of like toxic and uh, negative, but that's not the case. Like uh, if you meet like Bitcoiners at events like this, you find out they are very positive, very optimistic. So these would be the three characteristics. Awesome. So talking about Bitcoin education, I found um, your project, Justin, very interesting where you're bringing Bitcoin education to people in prison. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the project and also, you know, tell us why it's important to teach them about Bitcoin. Hello. All right. So 
Um, about the project, well, what, what was the last question you asked me? Um, to tell us why it's important to teach okay. people in prison about Bitcoin. All right, well, a little bit about the project. Um, the project came to life after I wrote my book called From Bars to Bitcoin. And um, it wasn't until, it was in 2016, I first heard about Bitcoin, first bought some Satoshis. But I had, um, I was locked up in America from 2011 to 2014. So I was looking for some type of hope and some type of way to change my life, but to be, you know, still on the big stage of doing things. So um, when I was learning it and I saw how it changed my life and just the opportunities that are available, not just, you know, being able to make money or um, watch your money go up, but for me, it was kind of how, you know, everyone on stage from Africa has been saying it's about freedom. And in America, if you have a record, you really have no freedom, you have no voice, you don't get a job that you are qualified to work for, and coming, trying to get money is kind of hard. So I put the project together after writing a book because I felt, um, you know, people in those and those communities needed. Like, there were, there were around the world, I just saw a lot of communities being made. Um, you know, what's going on in Indonesia, with El Salvador, in the jungles of Costa Rica, all over. I was like, well, hell, I can make a community. Um, and it started on Clubhouse in the Black Bitcoin Billionaires Group. I used to have these rooms called from bars to Bitcoin on Mondays. And people would come in, and people who were locked up or who had family members that were locked up or they, um, some of them were in prison still, and I would teach Bitcoin from there, and I noticed what connected, what, what was working with them. Um, from, like, real simple in prison, we don't have cash, and there used to be tobacco. So when they took the tobacco out, we had to find a different means of currency, whether it was stamps, whether it was chips, deodorant. So the mindset of knowing how to use a different currency was already in the people who were going to prison. And then uh, with the stamps, we had to set our own price. It was either 44 cents in the real world, it was 35 cents on the yard, so we would sell stamps like that, and we knew we had to keep it on the yard, we had to keep it in circulation. So when I came across Bitcoin, decentralization rang out just like stamps. Um, and I knew that that population uh, would understand it from that level. And so um, when we had gone to a prison, I did the same thing and I just saw people light up. They, they were lighting up because it was an opportunity to change their life with money. Um, it was a decentralized opportunity, no government to stop them. There is no minimum amount of money you have to make. You don't have to have a college degree. You can have a terrible record and still uh, participate in Bitcoin. So all of those factors matter. Um, so that was the reason the why for the project, to continue to spread hope the way I saw countries in the de um, developing countries do. And, you know, I heard a guy come up here earlier. He said, well, you know, the West, they don't, he kind of said, like, the West doesn't look for Africa to learn things. But I learned a lot just seeing how Africa was doing things on, on a level that wasn't the same in America. It was about purely hope and providing yourself opportunity. Um, so the second question was what again, Mary? <laughs> <laughs> it's why is it important to um, teach people in prison about Bitcoin? Yeah, because, all right, so the number one reason why, and this is probably globally, most people commit crime over money. Mm -hmm. um, you're either trying to sell drugs to get money, you're going to steal for money, you might kill for money, you might rob for money. You're doing something, it's either for money or you can't make the best decisions because you don't have money. So when you do that, you're committing crime for a currency that gets worse over time. Um, so... That was, the, that was the one main thing I always tell people. Like, I know a guy who did 30 years from 18 to 30, 48. The US dollar was worth like 98 cents when he went in. It was worth like 85 cents. And he went to prison over money. So going to prison over a currency that gets worse is just a backwards decision. Uh, another reason why you got people in there who have time to do nothing but learn. They can learn the Bitcoin ecosystem. They can read the white papers. They can even learn and read all the technical jargon. If you got five years in there that you don't do nothing but sit around and read, you could do that. And um, it, helps, it helps empower different entrepreneurs, but um, and also gives them a way to show how they can provide 
impact to Bitcoin. Similar to how Africa knows they can provide impact to Bitcoin, I feel that um, people incarcerated know they can as well. Wow, this is so great. Can, can we give a round of applause to Justin? That was awesome. I mean, imagine being in prison and learning about Bitcoin and coming out a better person and more empowered person. It's just really inspiring. Um, so I want to ask uh, this question to um, Ella. How do you think Bitcoin education can be improved? And also, like, how can access to Bitcoin education be improved as well? Yeah, thanks, Mary. Um, so I kind of think about it three different perspectives. Um, what, where, and how. So I think, you know, as we've kind of mentioned and has been brought up today, there's so many different perspectives you can educate on Bitcoin. So that's kind of the what, what perspective, what discipline, you know, from, as Joseph said, human rights to biology, it kind of covers it all. Um, where, so I guess to, to use an analogy, like you can buy Coke in any size bottle, any material bottle, any shape. Um, so when we think about Bitcoin education, you know, we should provide it in any size, any shape, any material. I think today there's, you know, board games, there's apps on your phone, there's podcasts, books, um, Spirit of Satoshi, which will come out, I think could be really cool as well. Um, and then how, and this might be one that's not as spoken about, but I think is very important. Um, well, one, stories, we talked about this today, so really telling your story can be powerful. Um, and then how do humans, you know, think about information and approach information? We have so many different cognitive biases. Um, I think a really prominent one is loss aversion. Most of us kind of live life to not lose instead of just winning. And Bitcoin, of, Bitcoin allows you know, everyone to win, um, but a lot of people don't think in that mode. Um, so yeah, there's just, I think, really how we frame the information. And you know, linguistic has been brought up today as well. That's also really important and can be used to help um, improve education as well. That's really good. So yeah. this leads me to my next question to Joseph. Like the, current Bitcoin tools that are in existence, do you feel they're really good in the area of educating newcomers about Bitcoin? Well, it's, it's definitely improving over the years. So I've seen uh, the Bitcoin ecosystem develop since like 2015. And back then, like using hardware wallets, for example, was uh, like, it was intimidating. You really had to know what you're doing. There was a lot of uh, weird jargon, weird terms. Uh, and you could do some kind of mistake easily. Uh, this has improved quite a lot over the years, but uh, then again, uh, the ecosystem itself developed so that now uh, we need to choose between on-chain or lightning transaction. Uh, maybe even the side chains will be adopted more, so there's another thing. Then, for example, with the seed, uh, we can have single sig, we can have uh, multi-sig, we can have uh, Shamir backups, passphrases on top of that. And so everything is getting a little bit more complicated. Uh, and one of the answer of the ecosystem to that is that there are very uh, comfortable, easy to use custodial solutions like Wallet of Satoshi. I think they are doing a great job. But uh, there's this trade-off that then you don't have the sovereignty that Bitcoin brings. So I believe uh, people need to, uh, there is some learning curve, and they need to do, do their homework if they want to uh, take self-custody, take the actual possession of Bitcoin. And uh, yeah, that's up to uh, the tool builders like uh, Trezor or software wallet uh, developers to make it intuitive, easy to navigate, uh, good onboarding uh, videos and uh, copy and stuff like that. So the UX uh, needs to improve, but it is actually improving. So I think compared to like five, seven years ago, uh, we as the builders are doing a very good job. Um, and we need to keep in mind that uh, uh, the Bit Bitcoin users are getting more mainstream. So seven years ago, uh, it was sort of fine to use specific terms and uh, for, for us to uh, anticipate that people know what they're doing, but that's no longer the case because uh, now it's people like uh, my mom or even my grandma starting to use Bitcoin. So everything needs to be really easy to navigate, but still we should uh, aim for people to do the self-custody properly. 
And I think it can be done, and it's being done, and a lot of very qualified people from other industries are actually coming to Bitcoin to work on that, which is amazing to see. Yeah, I mean, you have, you, when you're building something for Bitcoin, you need to have a lot, you need to consider a lot of things. Age, uh, also where they're coming from, their cultural background, that can be really tricky. Um, but yeah, I think what's happening now with like, as more awareness is being created on this subject, more people are becoming sensitive to how they build um, these projects. So my question goes to Justin, and I, I really love what he's doing. <laughs> I, I think it's quite unique because nobody thinks about going to a prison and you know, talking about Bitcoin to these guys. You feel like, oh, you're in prison, you're condemned, like that's the end of it. But um, this Bitcoin seems to be this beacon of hope to um, people who are in prison. Um, but I, I'm curious how, like, for someone who gets to learn um, from you, like this project, BT, BTC, TC, uh, how do they know they're making an impact? Well, um, if you're someone, well, we're, how we're going to make an impact is we're, we're striving everyone to be able to use Bitcoin and have access to the um, opportunities there. And one of those ways is we have a partnership, that's why we call ourselves a community with some companies in America, one called LFG Mining. Um, people probably heard of me, Premier Bitcoin, or my first Bitcoin, and uh, Cash App and Block, but um, which we recently became a recipient of one of their discovery grants, so Ooh. shout out to them. Congratulations, um, let's go. So the way we look to make an impact is using those partnerships and creating like um, creating trainings so you could learn, for instance, how to repair a general mine and to, uh, be like a general mine repair technician, uh, work on work have some type of work available to you when you get out of prison. Um, and by doing that, we we collect data. I have a um, a co-founder, Dr. Stacey Boyle, she has what she calls the impact blueprint model. It's a proprietary um, instrument she uses to log data to see like where we should go make impact and is this working here or is it not here? And the main way, you know, if you don't get a job in the space or anything, the main way is for you not to go back to prison. Um, I forgot who it was. I talked to someone earlier. They said, the person you are before Bitcoin is a totally different person you are after Bitcoin. So if we're in there, we're teaching, and you're like, man, I don't want to get no job. I just want to use it as a money. But you start using it, and you start seeing, like, man, um, you know, this has a lot of properties. Like, it, I've, I've heard, I might say his name wrong, Femi, you know, he was saying there's an ongoing discussion of, like, is this a medium of exchange, or is this a uh, storage of value? To me, it's like no matter what way you get here, you're going to see that all of that works. Mm -hmm. um, if you low on money, you're, you're going to probably use it for money. Um, for me personally, I remember I first learned about Bitcoin. I used to charge people $25 to go sell their wallet for them. I found ways to, to hustle Bitcoin or use it to make some money. And people, you know, no matter where you start, you'll find a way. But um, the biggest impact we like to make is to change someone's life getting them gainfully employed, and if they choose not to want that employment, then use Bitcoin to change their life however they see fit. Um, so overall, freedom and hope. Awesome. So I'm going to open the floor for questions. So take, have in mind that you have three amazing people here. One represents Bitcoin educators and, you know, Bitcoin tools. Another one represents, you know, bringing Bitcoin to the younger population. And another one represents the people who we think are forgotten, right? The people who are like, who literally have no hope. Um, so this is your, the best opportunity for you to ask questions to these guys because they have experience and maybe you could use their experience to orange peel people a lot better. Awesome, we have just three slots, three, two slots, sorry, two slots for two questions. So we have one and two, that's all, no time. He's too strict. <laughs> right. Thank you for having me. My name is Haruna. Um, I have, mine is a comment, a few comments I want to make. 
Um, regarding the Bitcoin, we've listened to our panelists, we've listened to those who came before this group of panelists came. Um, mine has to do with education and security. Education and security. Now, we've been listening to so many talks over talks. Now, I asked myself, how do I know or how do I approach Bitcoin? Because we've been talking all the good things about Bitcoin, we've been hearing all the good things about it, but how to approach it is another issue. So that you don't go and lose any asset in the quest of trying to know how to approach Bitcoin. I personally was introduced to Bitcoin or cryptocurrency a year and a half ago. And I can tell you for a fact that I've lost almost $45,000 so far because of lack of education. A gentleman who introduced me to Bitcoin also introduced me to decentralized apps why I started to buy some few Bitcoin here and there, Ethereum, if so to say, and started keeping them, trying to trade with them. Because I don't have in-depth knowledge about it, one day I woke up one morning and I lost everything. So Bitcoin is good, it's the future. I always tell my people it's the future. No matter what you are, no matter who you are, you will need Bitcoin in the future to come, five, 10 years to come, you bite your fingers and ask, why didn't you join today? But where is the education? It's very, very important. Thank you very much. Comment? Please, straight to the question. Yes, um, thank you, panelists. Um, my name is Emmanuel. Now, I noticed um, a lot of the comments have been made on, and they are focused on the younger generation. But we keep forgetting about the older generation. And if you look at a country like Africa, most of the people in government, most of the people in power, they are the people in the older generation. So one thing I noticed that no one has talked about is how do we preach adoption to people in the older generation? I have my father, I have my mother, how do I communicate to them? I've been speaking with my dad for over a year. It's very, very difficult to get him to understand the concept of Bitcoin. And this is coming from someone who uses Bitcoin. So it's a very difficult concept to approach to the older generation. And looking at their position, these are people that are directors, people in positions of power, people that are presidents. How do we address that? Because these people make the decisions. So we need to address adoption in the older generation. Thank you. So yeah, the first question, that's very good. Like, where do you begin and how to keep yourself secure? That's uh, <laughs> what I sort of specialize in. So, uh, my answer is there's a progression. So for uh, people that uh, want to uh, save in Bitcoin or invest in Bitcoin, don't jump straight in with like $50,000 uh, and try to manage that on your hardware wallet or anything because that's going to be very hard and very stressful. So the progression uh, that I came up with is uh, first you can Check it out, like how it works uh, with a wallet of Satoshi or Machankura. KG is here, that's a brilliant tool. And that's custodial, but that's fine for the beginning. It's just to, for you to, to see the power of Lightning Network, that you can send it anywhere in the world uh, instantly for very low, very low fees. Then you should make a progression to a self custodial Lightning wallet, like Phoenix, let's say. So you will be in charge, you will write down the seed words. Uh, you will be informed that uh, that is very important to keep safe. And uh, still, if you uh, make some mistake, you won't lose that much money because you are still handling like a couple of dollars there. Uh, once you're com comfortable doing that, then you are moving on to an on-chain software wallet like Green from Blockstream. That's a, that's a nice one. And then you're getting very close to uh, keeping your coin secure because you are handling your seed. Uh, you are getting like comfortable with that knowledge that it's only up to you to keep it safe and then uh, Perhaps you will want to save more in Bitcoin So you buy yourself a hardware wallet you will set up the seed you already know what the seed is by that point and uh, With hardware wallets, it's always a good idea to set it up write everything down then wipe the wallet and Try to recover the wallet from the seed board so that you are comfortable with recovering the wallet in, in case of some something goes wrong and you have actual money on the wallet. So that's like the most simple progression. It can take several weeks or several months for you, but it will save you a lot of stress, a lot of trouble in the future. And I believe like this is the way uh, responsible people should approach Bitcoin and self-custody. 
Awesome, thank you so much. Um, who wants to take the second one relating to how do we educate older people about Bitcoin? Um, phew, boy. Educating the old people about Bitcoin. Well, one way I, I notice is like, if it's like a family, um, family structure, they'll have to dip their toes in. Um, there's no other better way than experience. Like if it's your parents, your mom, dad, aunt, uncle, someone you can influence a little better, they can trust you. I think um, someone up here earlier spoke about a community and affecting your community. Um, you know how those people talk, you know how they react to things. But I think the best way is they have to, they have, to have some skin in the game. Um, it's kind of like if you're trying to, like if this is a fight, right? Oh, I think this person can beat this person. Nowhere, there's no words that's gonna determine the winner. They're gonna actually have to do it. They're gonna actually have to buy some Bitcoin. They're gonna actually have to go through um, the ups and downs of the price. They're gonna actually have to participate a little bit by bit. And then from there, I feel questions come up. They might come up every year, every two years, every time they see something on the news, they asking you, what is this, what is that? Um, and even if the government tries to ban it and they feel so scared that they don't know what to do, you'll still be like a, a person that can reassure them um, what's going on, how they can find more information. But if no one is willing to put their skin in the game, they'll never know. You know, I, I don't know where I read this quote, but they said like, to know and not do it is not to truly know. So they're not really interested in putting their, their own funds in the game to learn. They'll just be, you'll be wasting your time speaking to them. And for as far as government, I've never orange peeled a government uh, uh, official, but um, to the point I think the brother right here made earlier, we have to allow people who know how to talk to those people to empower those people. I know this one amazing woman in America by the name of Charlene Federico. I don't know if y'all know her, but um, she worked on the Hill in D.C. and. <laughs> We're unlikely, like on the outside looking in, you probably never think, oh, Charlene and Justin are friends. But it's those type of relationships that help move conversations along. So, um, you know, you keep an open mind and what needs to be, what needs to be done will come to you, you know. Um, Mary's sister Judy told us earlier, you don't worry about the how, you know, so you just keep a strong how, I mean, keep a strong why and everything will present itself eventually. But that's my best take on it. I don't know if Ella or Joseph have a way. Um, I just had one thing. I think younger generations, their baseline is perhaps lower with these topics. Older generations just have a lot more life experience. They've had more time to form opinions. And so I can't take credit for this idea, but um, Troy Cross said, instead of asking why do you believe that, so why do you believe Bitcoin is bad for the environment, instead ask how did you come to believe that? Because then it takes the pressure off of them for their opinion. And you can then say, oh, you know, I read X article or I heard from this person. And so I think that's just another helpful. Ooh, this is all great, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so make sure you meet these guys after this um, session so you can you know, get the conversation going and learn more about how you can educate your friends, family, and community. So thank you very much. Give them another round of applause. They did awesome. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for them as they get back on stage.